This is Jason Reed Pratt, author of Cry of Justice. Have you ever been wondering whether I'll get around to finishing up my schizophrenic multi-single-player game of Mark Herman's board game, Churchill, from GMT Games, against myself, against myself, against myself, but in some kind of summary, so that I won't waste too much more time on this game... game? <gasps> Me too! Fortunately, I have been playing turns down to the end of the game, and now I'm in position to summarize most of them in one fell swoop of a penultimate episode. But we'll start with a recap of the prior turn for November 1943. Um, I guess November 43 was really, really, really busy? That was also turn 4, and will be turn 5. I can verify. Here's that screenshot. I've even gone back to look at all three historical variants for both turns. They all read November 1943. Maybe someone should write a book about how this month was the most important of the war? Plenty was happening in real life 1943 in November, including the ejection of the Axis from North Africa and the Soviet tide surging into Belarusia. Practically nothing happened for this turn in the European theater, as usual so far in this game, but here's a reminder of where things are as far as they've gone. Down in the Pacific theater, Stalin's advance down toward Japan has been busily distracting the Empire from much opposition against the other fronts, where the Western Allies have also decided to focus so far. Unfortunately, I misunderstood a rule about breakthroughs and advanced the China-Burma-India front a step too far into Hong Kong, so I'll have to pull it back. No breakthrough can advance into a naval invasion space, which, from the white anchor on the blue circle, you can see Hong Kong is, for some reason. Fortunately, that was the first successful breakthrough roll, so I don't have to adjust the U.S. Pacific fronts back anywhere. A breakthrough can advance out of a naval space onto land, but that only applies in practice to Normandy and Italy. Turn 4 ended with Churchill and Stalin close to tied at 36 and 35 points respectively, and with the United States slowly catching up at 17 points. However, there is a key error built into the scoring that I hadn't detected yet, which I'll be adjusting out later when I get around to it. That's the catch-up. Let's get to it. Turn 5! The Eureka Conference in Tehran, also November 1943. The conference ends with Churchill played to break a UK and USSR tie. Churchill suffers a heart attack, leaving him inactive for the upcoming turn six. The Europe map shows a lot of political and partisan activity, and the British managed to push back the Axis into Sicily. The British weren't, however, able to properly advance into Hong Kong this turn. But the United States did surge the Central Pacific Front into the Caroline Islands, despite a Victoria sally by the Imperial Navy to nick off some naval support and return home alive. This advance tightened up the distance between the two Pacific Fronts, eliminating five points from Britain and Russia over U.S. embarrassment at inter-service rivalry. Most importantly, Stalin steamrolled into Korea against the Imperial Army Reserve, picking up eight points. He has also built up enough naval support that he expects to punch into Japan itself on turn six, shutting down the Pacific Front before the Western Allies can get close enough to score. Turn 5 ends, uh, sorry for the lower-res snapshot here, I forgot to zoom in for clarity when videoing, with the USSR currently winning in second place with a combined score of 58 points, together with the US, against the UK's first place, 45 points, 27 points ahead of the third place. Stalin, in red, should show 40 here, not 39. However, keep in mind there's a score error involved that I haven't accounted for yet. On then to turn six, the Prime Minister Conference in London, June 1944. A pretty big jump there, skipping all of spring, which makes me wonder if turn five was really supposed to be spring 44. Churchill is inactive for his own hosted conference due to a heart attack last turn. Realizing, at last, the full extent of their stupidity in sparring with each other and ignoring Stalin's activation of the Far East Front, Churchill and Roosevelt finally agree to cooperate better between themselves to try and forestall Stalin advancing into Japan and shutting down the whole Pacific theater. The U.S., despite a strong British hand, solidly wins the conference with four topics, but Churchill knows that the U.S. will use that support in helping the CBI front. Consequently, the United Kingdom actually devotes some production to help its Mediterranean front advance into southern Italy, eliminating the Italian reserves. A lot of polymill action up here in Europe, 
plus partisans down in the colonies, will be changing the score quite sharply, too. Stalin, meanwhile, legitimately forgets that the two naval markers in Japan are still active. The Japanese Navy wisely, although randomly, doesn't sortie out to nix a different front. The rules should say that all surviving Imperial fleets focus on any front trying to enter Japan. Consequently, all Stalin's efforts this turn are toast, as he doesn't have the naval support to get in after all. He'll need five naval supports to be sure of any invasion effort, and he only had three now reduced to one. I realize I'm house-ruling this quite a bit, but the official Axis rules are unclearly inept in this area. The U.S. advances into the Marianas, a B-29 space, but not into the Philippines yet. With help from the U.S., the CBI front enters Hong Kong. The turn ends with Stalin having jumped into the lead, largely thanks to polymill action, at 46 points, still more than 20 points ahead of the United States' 22, so triggering Churchill currently winning in second place with those 22 plus his own 43. However, keep in mind I still haven't adjusted for the scoring error yet. From here to turn 7, the Octagon Conference in Quebec, September 1944. Stalin draws a rather weak hand, and so, despite loading up his agenda win with Western offensive chips, he barely escapes with being able to secure his own offensive chip against two quite strong Western hands who are determined to keep him out of Japan until they can get there too. FDR wins the conference again with four topics to Churchill's two. The Mediterranean Front fails to advance into central Italy, but the Atlantic Front finally beats the Kriegsmarine and wins Bolero. This raises the possibility of Normandy at last. The Imperial Home Fleet chose to stay home and eat off two of Stalin's naval supports, but he had spent his four available productions on adding enough naval support that he wouldn't have to load up completely next time. His theory was that until Normandy draws off Germany's defensive wall, he might as well keep trying to invade Japan and shut down the Pacific Theater, even if the odds were low. He would never be able to convince the others that he planned to use their directed offenses in Europe anyway. Churchill was a bit blindsided by an obscure rule which FDR reminded him about. The U.S. directed offense in Hong Kong has to first fill out naval support to the maximum before adding offensive support when the front was poised for a naval op, which this was. Consequently, the U.K. only had a 60% chance of reaching Formosa, which is modern Taiwan. But with the three, they advanced anyway and scored five points. The United States chose the Philippines to be the certain success for this turn, but gave enough support to Iwo Jima that the Central Pacific Front easily rolled up for an advance as well. Iwo Jima gave the U.S. two points, and MacArthur returned to the Philippines at last, reducing both the U.K. and the USSR by three potential points each. Turn 7 ends with the U.K. and USSR apparently tied at 43 points, only 15 points ahead of 28 for the United States, and so truly tied, but there is still a scoring error that I haven't adjusted for yet. With only three more turns in the game, Turn 8, the Tolstoy Conference in Moscow, October 1944. FDR stays in Washington, so is inactive for this conference. Due to the Leyte Gulf Axis event, Stalin will have more of a chance to get into Japan this turn. Japan sends a naval and an army reserve to the southwest pack front to protect Kyushu, as it happens. Stalin's quite strong hand and his excellent agenda starting position allow him to resist the Western double-team effort somewhat. He wins Pacific leadership and a U.S. production, but loses Soviet offense to the U.S., and Churchill wins the conference with the other three directed offenses. Everyone, including Stalin, agreed to agree on the second front attempting an open this turn, since Stalin knows this will necessarily divert resources to building up naval support at least. Since it's obvious after the conference that the Westerns, led by Churchill, will definitely get into Japan, Stalin chooses not to put any of his production there. Why? because he already scored eight points for taking Korea, and he wouldn't gain any more by entering Japan. French replace prior scores as they advance. This was still worth trying when he had a chance to shut down the Pacific Theater and keep the U.S. and U.K. from any more scores, but that's going to happen now regardless. His Pacific leadership is useless now, too, although had he been able to reduce the risk of the Westerns getting into Japan, that might have been useful for helping him secure a shutdown. Stalin will give Pacific leadership to Churchill, since this won't affect the game at all anymore, including scoring at the end, and it's a gesture of respect for being the one to lead the Westerns in. Instead, Stalin puts his remaining productions, after his directed offense in the Central Pacific, to stacking up offensive supports on the Don River. Since the lack of naval support, only four even with the U.S.'s Eastern Theater Command, will necessarily prevent any chance at Normandy this turn, unless the U.K. spends two production on helping beef up there, which the FDR cannot expect. 
The U.S. loads up his remaining production after directed offensive duties with a sure advance in the Central Pacific. Stalin's chances of advance thanks to German resistance are still low, but he ekes out a step into Belarusia. The Axis rolls a huge tin in the Mediterranean, however, punching off Anzio after all, thanks to that random German army reserve. The rules dictate that the two Japanese reserve armies still in Japan must face the Soviets. They'd rather be beat by the Westerns, given the choice, which reduces Stalin's chances to nothing. The Imperial Navy, plus kamikazes, stopped the U.S. advance out of the Philippines into Kyushu by destroying too much of the naval support. The U.S. puts enough support in Central Pacific, thanks to winning Stalin's own dedicated offense chip, to advance into Okinawa, upscaling the U.S. score on this track from two points to five. This advance isn't far enough along the track to trigger infighting among the U.S. Pacific leaders again, so the other players don't recover five points. Last, but certainly not least, the U.S. and the U.K. put the CBI front into Japan, shutting down the Pacific Theater for the rest of the game. The U.K. replaces its five points from Formosa with eight points, adding three up to 47. The U.S. also gets eight points for this front, however, not having to replace anything either. The turn ends with the U.K. in the lead at 47 points, and the USSR and U.S. trailing at 43 and 40 points. Except remember, this still includes an invalid scoring error that I haven't adjusted for yet. Two turns remaining to get more done in Europe. It'll be a tight-fought match as turn nine starts. The Argonaut Conference in Yalta, February 1945. As in the historical Yalta, FDR marginalizes Churchill to get on Stalin's side. So Winston is inactive for this conference. Unlike historically, FDR is unable to attend due to failing health, and so is also inactive. Stalin wins the agenda phase, 5-2-2. to two to two. With both Westerns tied at two strength, all their topical picks go to the middle of the table. FDR surprises the others by not advancing Normandy's topic, instead opting for points, global and polymill 2-2. Two two. No one puts in strategic materials, not wanting to risk giving Stalin anything extra whereas Stalin picks directed offenses and productions for his topics. After a hard-fought conference with Stalin's USSR offense at stake due to a card event, Stalin wins the conference with four topics, including his offense and the European Theater Command. Everyone loads up on their respective fronts in accordance with the directed offensive placements. The U.S. actually has one leftover resource, plus one support from starting with European Theater Command, which he doesn't spend anywhere since Normandy is pointless now. There is no way the Atlantic Front can reach Germany, and the ailing Roosevelt decided to just focus on political opportunities, and trying to keep Stalin from breaking through twice into Germany. The U.S. won the global topic, giving him five points up to 42. Roosevelt chooses to back self-determination to nerf Churchill's colonialism, which will allow anyone, such as, for example, the United States this turn, having also won the 2-2 poly mill chip, which he spends a production activating, to put political markers into the colonies. The polymill activity on the map gets pretty crazy, shuffling scores around a lot before the European fronts make their rolls. Britain has a 20% overpower chance to get into northern Italy, kind of by accident, but fails it. They do automatically proceed into Rome, giving Churchill two points plus another two for getting there before the western front enters Normandy, up four points to 51. The big news, however, is that between them, the western allies and the German reserve armies, credit where it's due, stifled Stalin's chance of creating a breakthrough this turn. He manages to keep an 80% chance thanks to all his offensive support, and barely squeaks into the Ukraine on rolling a 7. This doesn't score him anything. And while it does remove all Western partisan groups and the flanking minor nations, in this case that's only Britain's partisan in Romania, which doesn't drop Churchill's score since the political marker cannot be moved yet, and that was superseding the partisan score with 3 points. Much more importantly, even if Stalin does create a breakthrough on turn 10, he cannot possibly enter Germany by the end of the game. Germany, therefore, will not surrender, and, having settled its own Nazi problem at last, will be able to broker peace. We'll see what kind of insanity this whole set of events brings to fruition in the next and final episode, where, whatever else happens, one thing is certain. I. Will. Lose. Twice. Doom, 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 doom. Amen, 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 amen.